Well, good morning. My name is Christian. If you're new here, um, it's Pleasure to have you with us. My name is Christian. I just said that. My name is Christian again. I'm one of the pastors and elders here at Cornerstone. I get the opportunity um, to open God's word with you. I have noticed this morning, we do a little pre-service time over with the children's ministry, and I was getting ahead of myself. I was trying to speak faster than I could put words together. I will endeavor to take a breath and jump in this, but I am super excited for what we get to walk through this morning. Even the way the songs we just sang, the goodness of our God, his faithfulness, his sufficiency to provide for us is really at the heart of what this Sermon on the Mount is all about, which is where we've been for the last several months. This morning, we're, we're gonna be in chapter seven, verses seven through 12. So if you have a Bible, you can go ahead and open up there. If you need a Bible, the ushers would love to give you one. If you don't have one, this can totally be yours to take with you, or it can just be something you can use during the service. But the passage we're going to be in this morning, Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 12, in many ways marks the conclusion of the main body of Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. He has more to say in the rest of chapter 7. The next few weeks, we're going to see how he really concludes this incredible sermon with these three metaphors that really just present us with the same thing in three different ways. Which, what are you going to choose? How are you going to live your life? On the one he says, are you gonna choose the narrow gate, the hard path that leads to life that few find? Or the wide gate, the easy path that leads to destruction, but many are on it. He says, a good free can't, tree can't bear bad fruit, and a bad tree can't bear good fruit. So look honestly at your life. What is coming out of your life? He says, a wise man builds his house on rock versus sand. What are you building your life upon? That's what we're going to see over the next few weeks as we finish up our time in the Sermon on the Mount. But like I said, what we look at this morning really kind of wraps up the main like central body of the Sermon on the Mount that started all the way back in chapter 5, verse 17, when Jesus said this, do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. He says, I'm not coming to get rid of this. I'm coming to bring it to its intended purpose. And then he says to his disciples, he says, therefore, anyone who relaxes these commands, makes them more easy, doable, takes the heart out of them to make them just more bottom shelf things you can do on your own apart from a relationship of dependence upon God, they will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But those who keep them and teach others to do them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And then we've seen throughout the rest of chapter five and six and seven, how Jesus illustrates this idea that he came to fulfill the law through so many different real life circumstances. How do we deal with anger, lust, divorce? How do we honor commitments that we make? Not retaliating when people strike against us, even showing love to our enemies, the way we pray, the way we give, the way we fast, even like Todd showed us last week, the way that we learn to judge rightly, deal with the log in our own eye so that we can help one another see where we're out of line. And this whole section then comes to a conclusion in the last verse that I'm actually going to start with this morning in chapter 7, verse 12, where Jesus says this. So whatever you would wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. You see there the repetition of that phrase, law and the prophets. This is what scholars call an inclusio, or a, it's like bookends. It's like the two pieces of bread on a sandwich that hold everything together. From 517 to 712, this is where Jesus is talking about this idea of the fulfillment of, of the law and the prophets. And so what I'm actually going to do this morning, we're going to start with verse 12 and then come back at ver and look at verses 7 through 11. Because in many ways, this is a very familiar passage of Jesus' teaching. It has a traditional name. Does anybody know what we typically call this verse? What was that? The golden rule. I was doing a little research on it, and apparently that name actually comes from a king back in history who took this phrase of Jesus, had it etched on a plate of gold, and hung on the wall behind him in his throne room. It was the literal golden rule. But this is interesting because this is one of those parts of Jesus' teaching that seems almost common sense. Yeah, be nice to people, right? This is one of those things that even people who might reject the idea of Jesus as God, reject the idea that Jesus truly did rose from the dead, 
they can still get behind this one. Yeah, okay, I like this. I like the good teacher, just another one in a long line of good teacher's views of Jesus. Because, yeah, I like this. Treat others the way that you want to be treated. But pay attention. Because even though this is familiar to us, and even we might read that and kind of just nod our heads, yeah, it makes sense. Be nice to people. When we look at this golden rule, not just on its own hung on a plaque on the wall in gold or in some crafty farmhouse style you might find in a Hobby Lobby or something like that. But when we look at this verse within its context in the Sermon on the Mount, it is talking about something so much bigger and more challenging and costly. It may sound like common sense, but to actually live this way does not come common or natural to any of us. Yet for those of us who are apprentices of Jesus, his disciples, this is the target that Jesus has given us. This is the mission he has given us in the way that we live our lives. And even if you're in here this morning and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, you're still trying to figure it out, even more listen carefully because this is what Jesus is calling you to should you choose to follow him. Another reason why we sometimes think of the golden rule as just like a commonplace, common teaching is because we actually do see commonalities between the words of Jesus here and other philosophers and religious teachers throughout history. There's a very famous Chinese philosopher, Confucius, who lived about 500 years before Jesus, and he said something very similar. Look at the way Confucius said it. This is in translation, of course, so it's a little bit clunky, but do not unto others what you would not want others to do to you. Sounds similar, right? Even within Jewish history, there was a famous rabbi, Rabbi Hillel, who lived right about the turn of the first century between B.C. and A.D. As a matter of fact, as best we can tell, he probably died while Jesus was a, a teenager or something like that. So somewhat of a contemporary with Jesus. He was asked at one point, I don't know, it's kind of one of those funny things. Someone asked him, can you explain, can you explain to me the entirety of the law, of the Old Testament law, while standing on one foot? Why on one foot? I have no idea, but that's what it says. And so this is what Hillel says in response to that. He says, again, on one foot, picture that. That which is hateful to you, I can't even do it, I'm going to lose my balance. That which is hateful to you, do not do unto your fellow. That's the whole Torah, the whole law. The rest is commentary. Do you see the similarity with Jesus' teaching? But there's also a really important difference between the way that Confucius and Hillel said it and the way that Jesus said it. Did you catch what the difference was? Both of these teachers stated in the negative. What you don't want others to do for you, don't do that to them. Jesus, though, as best as we can tell, the first person in history to flip it around so incredibly positively. Not just don't do what's hateful to others, but whatever you would wish that others would do for you, do also for them. It's emphatically positive. And there's a big difference. Like those of us in here who are parents or ever had parents, you know the difference between that, right? There is a big difference between saying, stop hitting your brother and saying, hey, can you serve your brother? Can you take care of him? Stop being mean to your sister. Would you go out of your well, way to encourage them today? Like there's a, there's a monumental difference between just don't do mean things and go out of your way. That's the thing. Both Hillel and, and um, Confucius' statements is almost kind of like a, hey, you stay in your area, I'll stay in mine, and we'll just won't bother each other. Like, don't get in each other's way. No, Jesus' command is on the very opposite. Go out of your way to be proactively good to others. And not only that, this is an all-encompassing statement. Literally in the Greek, it reads like this. And again, it's choppy, but go with me. So, everything whatever that you would wish others would do for you, do likewise also for them. That's the whole of the law and the prophets. Everything. Whatever it might be, whatever circumstance it might be, everything that you would want others to do for you, do that for them. If you're out of line and you would want someone to come to you in love, not with force, and graciously, patiently point it out to you, do that to them. That's what Todd was talking about last week, right? 
in every situation. See, when you stop and you look at it like that, we should think twice before we pick that up from Hobby Lobby and hang it on our door. Do we really want to sign up for that? This is a costly, more than just some common sense proverb, this is a costly way of living. This is a call to radical, sacrificial generosity. And by generosity, I don't just mean with money. Generosity with our time, with our energy, with the stuff we might have, our abilities, our relationships. Generosity with forgiveness. Remember that in the Lord's Prayer? Forgive us in the same way that we forgive others. To be generous in granting forgiveness to those who wrong you. Because isn't that what you would want if you were in that situation? As citizens of Jesus' kingdom, which is what this sermon is all about, Jesus is calling us as disciples for our lives to be marked by that same kind of radical generosity, that same intention to do good to others, including even, like he said in chapter 5, loving our enemies. To put the character of God on display through our lives because our God is one who causes his sun to shine on the evil and the good and gives rain to the just and the unjust. And Jesus, as king, says, let your light so shine before men that they see what comes out of your life and they go, wow, give glory to your Father in heaven. This is big Everything, whatever it is that you would wish others to do for you, do so to them. How can Jesus expect that of us? How can Jesus, how can we be expected to live up to such a standard? I mean, the more I was looking into this, the more, the more why it made sense to me why Confucius and Hillel stated it in the negative. That's a lot more doable for us, isn't it? If you don't want someone to cut you off on the freeway and give you the one finger salute as they go by, don't do that to them, right? That's doable. Just don't, or at least we think it's more doable. But the way that Jesus says it, the way that he not only says it, but commands it of all of us who are his disciples, this is much bigger. So again, does Jesus honestly expect us to live this way? Or is this one of those places where Jesus is setting the bar so high that we can't possibly meet it and we're just basically supposed to fall on our knees and say, God, I can't, would you forgive me? Maybe. Or is this kind of like a lot of like philosophers and religious teachers throughout history? This is more like a platitude, a, a wishful thinking kind of a thing. It'd be great if people lived this way, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be great if we could just be the change we want to see in the world? Oh, it'd be so good. Love that quote, great sentiment. But in some ways, statements like that, it's a bit like asking for world peace on your Christmas list. <laughs> right? It's like easy to ask for, good thing to ask for, but are you really expecting that to be under the tree? No, right? Is that what Jesus is doing? Is he setting us up to fail or is this just wishful positive thinking on Jesus' part? I think you can imagine, I don't think the answer is either of those. Instead, I think actually to, to understand what Jesus is driving at and the way that this is actually something he expects us of, of us is to step back for a second, actually scoot ahead a little bit in the book of Matthew to a story that we come across in Matthew chapter 14. You can turn there if you want to, but this is a very well-known story from the life of Jesus when he feeds the 5,000. 5,000 men, not even counting all the women and children, so it could have been twice or even uh, more than twice that many people there. But if you remember that story, Jesus is out in the hills. He's teaching this massive group of people all day. The sun has set. The disciples come to him and they go, Jesus, okay, this is awesome, man. Like, I love a good long church service as much as anybody, but folks are getting hungry. Can we send them back to the town so they can get food to eat? Do you remember what Jesus says? They don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. Um, how can you expect that of us, Jesus, right? Like we, we found this one kid who brought lunch, the one proactive plan ahead kid in the group. <laughs> He's got like five pieces of pita, pita bread and a couple of fish. But what is that for so many? Remember what Jesus said? He says, okay, bring it to me. He has the people sit down. They sit down on the grass and it says this. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish. He looked up to heaven and said a blessing 
Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds, and they all ate and were satisfied. As you continue, they picked up 12 giant baskets full of stuff. They had way more left over than what they started with. So here's the question I have for you. Did the disciples obey Jesus' command? He said, you give them something to eat. Did they obey that? Yeah, it says right there. The disciples gave the food to the crowds. They obeyed. But how were they able to obey that command? Only because of the blessing and the power of Jesus. How could Jesus expect them to do that? Well, definitely not on their own, but absolutely through his blessing, his power. Think about this. Hold this in your mind for a second. Jesus in this story is both the one who gives the commands and gives the means to obey the command. They go together. Now bring that with you and come back to chapter two, uh, 7, verse 12, with this golden rule. Jesus commands us to a radical, sacrificial generosity in all of our relationships and the way we go about doing it. How can he expect us to live this way? Only if God already lives this way. Only if this is already the character and heart and reputation of our God. Here's the point. You and I will only live a life of radical generosity with our time and energy and relationships, our lives, to the extent that we believe that God is already radically generous toward us. There's a direct relationship between the sufficiency and generosity with which you view God and the way that you will operate that way in your life and your relationships. Because, man, if the golden rule is just a try harder command, conjure up more goodness, good feelings, let alone good resources to do this, you and I will never even get out of the starting blocks on this one. But if, on the other hand, we know that we have a Father in heaven who has an inexhaustible supply of everything that is needful to do what he's called us to do, then we won't shrink back from a command like this. We also sure as heck won't try to do it on our own strength. We will go to our Father. We will seek from him the same blessing and power to do what he's called us to do that the disciples found from Jesus with the loaves and the fish. Does that make sense? See, this is why the golden rule, it's so important. It's fine to put it on a sign. I'm not trying to make fun of fancy signs from Hobby Lobby or anything like that. But it's fine to put it on a sign. But even more importantly, make sure you put it in its context within the Sermon on the Mount. You see, because before Jesus gives us such a radical command to generosity, look back at verse 7. Look what he says right before this. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. How do we even attempt to live out the standard of the golden rule? How do we live such radical generosity? Ask our Father in heaven. He has what we need. Seek him, his kingdom, his righteousness. Trust he'll provide for your needs like we saw in chapter six. Knock and it will be open to you. I love that. I was thinking about that, that part about knock and it will be open. And it's like the difference of like going trick, trick or treating in my neighborhood with my kids on Halloween. And the difference between the houses that are all lit up and decked out and people sitting in their front yards and the people who like turn everything off and pretend like they're not home. Like, it's very clear, one person wants you to knock on their door, the other person wants you to, like, not even think their house exists, right? And Jesus is saying, the lights are on. Your father is home. He's expecting you. Knock. He'll open the door to you. How can we believe that that actually will happen? When we ask the Lord for what we need, he will grant it. Because Jesus says, everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. When he knocks, it will be open. Now, we got to stop for a second here. Because we can take these verses, again, if we rip them out of their context in the same way we like to do with the golden rule, these quickly become blank check promises, don't they? 
God will give us whatever we want. We've got daddy's credit card and he doesn't mind how much we spent. Or it's like the genie in the bottle kind of an idea. When we pray, God's like, send there, your wish is my command. That's not what this is about at all. If we, if we treat the words of Jesus that way, we, we misunderstand the character of our God. We actually demean him by thinking he's our servant. That is not what this is about. Instead, I would say, just like we need to keep the golden rule in its context within the Sermon on the Mount, we need to keep these commands and promises about asking and seeking and finding in the context as well. I mean, think about it. Jesus says, ask and you will receive. Ask for what? He's been telling us what to ask for throughout the sermon. Do you remember back in chapter 6? I mean, just even looking at the Lord's Prayer. Father, give us today our daily bread. Forgive us in the same way that we forgive others. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And even before that, we said the even bigger requests of the Lord's Prayer is may your name be honored, may your kingdom come, may your will be done in my life, in my community, in our church, in our world, as it is in heaven. That's what we're asking for. Seek and you will find. But seek for what? Think back just to look up a little bit ahead to the end of chapter 6. Seek first what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness. Trust he'll take care of what you need to eat and drink and wear. What are we to seek for? God's good rule in our lives. His righteousness and you will find it. Knock and it will be open. What are we knocking on? Is this like a superstitious knocking on wood kind of thing? What are we, what's the knocking? This is one rather than looking back. Just look a couple verses forward. Look at verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate. That's the door we're looking to have open. The narrow, hard path that leads to life that Jesus says, there's few who find it and yet seek and you will find it. Seek it and you will find it. I would say this. So many of the themes that we've been looking at over the last several months here in the Sermon on the Mount come to a head right here in these commands. These, it's both an invitation and a command that Jesus gives us to ask and seek and knock. Come, your father is ready and willing and more than capable of supplying for you. And it's also a command, you've got to. There's no other way than this. I mean, think about just what we've seen throughout this sermon. How do we learn to live as salt and light within the world around us? Not cloistered off by ourselves where no one can see us like a lamp that you put a book, bushel over it, but also not carried away by the world around us, but having that preservative effect. How do we learn how to do that, to live in that tension of being in the world and yet not of the world that Jesus talks about later in John? Well, ask. Ask. Father, teach us how to do this. Give us what we need to do this. How do we, as Jesus says in Matthew 5, have a righteousness that exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees, without which he says we won't even enter the kingdom of God? Ask and seek and knock. Your Father has what you need. How do we learn to judge rightly, love our enemies, honor our commitments? How do we learn to do the right things with the right motives, not to be seen by men, but to, because we want reward from our Father in heaven? Father, we're asking you, teach us how to do this. Show us the way. In sum, what Jesus says at the end of chapter five, how do we learn to be perfect as our heavenly father is perfect? Our father has what we need. Ask him, ask him. The entire Sermon on the Mount hinges on these two realities. If you've taken notes, write this down. Here's the two things that we keep seeing throughout the Sermon on the Mount. We do not have what we need to obey Jesus' commands. That's the first one. We don't have it in and of ourselves. And I bet you can guess what the second one is. God has what we need. God has what we need to obey Jesus' commands. This is what we see throughout this sermon. I mean, think about the very first words that Jesus says at the very beginning in Matthew 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, the impoverished, those who recognize their spiritual poverty, who recognize they don't have what they need on their own, so they look to the one who has it 
And Jesus says, they are blessed. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. A couple of verses later, verse six. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Why are you hungry and thirsty? Because you don't have it. He says, they will be satisfied. How? How will our hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God be satisfied? Ask and you will receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock, the door will be open to you. And keep asking, don't stop. Actually, that's the more literal way to translate this. Not just ask, but keep asking. Keep seeking, keep knocking. It's a call to persistence. Keep going, not a half-hearted every once in a while. Maybe once I get myself into a pickle, well, I don't know how to get out of it. I'll do like the phone a friend thing like they used to do on who wants to be a millionaire. And like, I don't know the answer, so now I'll ask God. Now, don't get me wrong. God absolutely answers the honest, desperate prayers of us when we are in hard spots. But what Jesus is calling us here is not some sort of Hail Mary emergency call prayer. He says, keep going, be persistent. Build this as a daily habit in your life. Be persistent in asking and seeking and knocking from your father. But why do we need to be so persistent? Didn't he say back in chapter six that our father knows what we need before we ask him? Why do we need to keep going with this? Is it because God's kind of complacent? He's kind of just kicking back with his feet up on the couch and we've really got to rouse him. We've really got to, to get his attention, persuade him to care for his people. Not at all. He loves us. He profoundly loves his children. And yet Jesus calls us to persistence in prayer because that's what it is to be God's child. To live in relationship with God as our Father is to live in a daily state of trust and dependence on Him. Remember again the Lord's Prayer. Give us today our daily bread. Come to Him each day, Lord, not just with, we talked about that when we were, we were talking about the Lord's Prayer, not just bread, not just food, but daily bread representing all the things that are needful for the day. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know if I've had a day yet where I woke up, looked at my schedule and went, yep, I think I know everything I need for today. And then I went to bed that night and went, yep. The day went exactly as I thought. Our lives are filled with unplanned, unexpected, a curveball that changes things. It's unexpected to us. It is not unexpected to our Father in heaven. What a privilege to wake up each day and say, Father, you know what today holds for me better than I do. Would you give me what you know that I need today? I'm asking, I'm seeking, I'm knocking. Jesus assures us that our Father is ready and willing to give us the good things that we need to do what he's called us to do. He gives us this comparison. He shows us by setting this comparison between human fathers and our heavenly father. Look what he says there in verse eight. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father or your father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? He says, think about if you are a father or a mother, or again, you have a father or mother. We know we're not perfect. We struggle. We're sinful. We, we bristle against the word that Jesus used here. But if we're honest, there is evil within our hearts. Some of us have dealt with atrocious evil from our parents. And if that's you, I get it. I know for many of you, you struggle with this very idea of God as father because the father that you had here on earth mistreated you, neglected you. Maybe you never even knew who he was because he was completely absent from your life. And, and please hear me when I say this. I don't mean to dim, dismiss or diminish the pain of that in any way. But I do want to assure you, even if it's hard for you to believe the words that I'm gonna say right now, 
Your father in heaven is not like your earthly father. He, he is the song we just prayed. He is a good, good father. He loves his children. That is who he is. And if you are in Christ, if you have come to Jesus and have been adopted now by God as his child, you are loved by him. That's who you are, more than your own failures and weaknesses, no more, more than the way that your parents might have hurt you, you are defined more than anything by God's love for you. And it, if you're not a follower of Jesus yet, man, today is a great day to come to him. Today is a great day to start to trust in Jesus as the one who now brings you to the Father. If you're unsure that you can trust this God or believe that he actually is good, well, ask him, seek him. Would you show me if you really are that good, would you open my eyes to see it? Would you soften my heart? Would you give me faith to trust in your love that you say you have for your children? But come back with me, if you will, for a moment. Let's come back and look again at the comparison that Jesus is making here in this verse. His comparison isn't just about how bad human fathers can be. But his point is that, man, it is such a testimony to the grace of God, even on sinful, rebellious humans, that by and large, generally, human parents still want to do good to their children. They still want to give their children that which is healthy and, and beneficial to them. And why do we want to do that for our kids? Because we love them. We do. By the grace of God, sinful parents love their kids. Praise you, Lord, for that. And yet Jesus says, if that's how evil, imperfect fathers and mothers like us if we still know how to give, give, give good gifts to our children, how much more does our heavenly father know how to give good gifts to those who ask him? This is what's called a rhetorical question. And yet the answer is worth saying. How much more? Infinitely much more. Is our father able to give good gifts to us? Now, here's what I want you to see. This is where, go with me on this. This promise that Jesus says that our father is able to do much more in terms of giving good gifts to his children is not just a future promise that God will do good things for us. It is a promise rooted in the fact that God has already given good things to us. Not only that, he has already given us the greatest thing if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, understand this. Not only will God give you good things, he has already given you the greatest thing, the thing which was most costly and precious to him. He has given you Jesus. Like God's, I love that, John three sixteen. It's not just something we rip out and we hold up at sports games. Though we can do that. What does it say? God loved the world to such an extent that he gave us his son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So here's the point. If God has already given us Jesus, the one who is most precious to him, is he really gonna hold out on us now? Is he really gonna hold out on giving us that which is needful, not just to get our every wish and whim, but to do what he's called us to do? This is the point that Paul makes in Romans chapter eight. This huge expo ex exposition of the beauty of Jesus of what he's done. And he comes to it and he says this, what are we going to say? Seriously, what do we say in response? If God's for us, does it even matter who's against us? If he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with Jesus graciously give us all things? He won't hold back now. But again, we have to be careful because sometimes we read that verse there, he will graciously give us all things and we start to think, oh, blank check, genie in a bottle, he'll give me whatever I want. That's not what he's talking about. Doesn't mean that. But what it does mean is that for those of us who have trusted in Jesus, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt, though sometimes we doubt, 
that God is for us, that he does not need to be motivated to love us. He is already motivated to love us and care for us. And he's not just motivated by good things that we've done or demotivated by bad things that we've done. Why is God motivated to love his children? Well, there within Romans 8, Paul makes it very clear. He loves us because he chose to set his love on us before the foundation of the world. That is good news. This promise also means that, as Paul says at the end of Romans 8, if it's not anything we've done to earn God's love, there is also nothing in all of creation that could ever separate us from God's love. It also means, as he says just before this in Romans 8, that we serve a God who is so sufficient, so powerful, that all things can still work for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. He is able to work good even in the midst of trial and suffering and hardship because his purpose is to make us like Jesus, to conform us to the image of his son and nothing can get in his way or stop that purpose. That's good news, isn't it? I need that. I need to be reminded of that. I need to be reminded that nothing can stop God's purpose to continue to conform me into the image of Jesus. I need it especially when life doesn't go the way I planned, when my day doesn't go the way I planned, when those around me didn't get the script that I sent them of how I imagined the day to go, right? It's not beyond my father's attention, his care, his wisdom. He loves me, he cares for me, he can and he will use even the unexpected moments, events of the day, the unplanned, even painful seasons in life to accomplish his purpose to make me more like Jesus. Why wouldn't I keep asking and seeking and knocking? He's already given us Jesus. But not only has he given us Jesus, he has also given us another equally ultimate gift. He's given us his spirit. If you are a follower of Jesus, the spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity has been given to you to dwell within you and empower you to be the people that God's called us to be. Go with me for a moment here. The parallel of what we see here in Matthew 7 is found in Luke chapter 13, another event where the same thing takes place. Jesus says almost exactly the same words, but with a really significant difference. Again, in Matthew 7, he says, if evil fathers know how to give good gifts, how much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? But what does he say there in Luke 11? What does he say the father wants to give us? The Holy Spirit. That's the good gift. How much do we cheapen this if we think it's just about getting more health and wealth for ourselves? And why does Jesus give us the Holy Spirit? Well, the same reason he handed the loaves and the fish back to the disciples. So that we might have the means to do what God's commanded us to do. The Holy Spirit is the one who works within us to bring his fruit of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. This amazing blessed life of the kingdom of God that we've been reading about throughout the Sermon on the Mount, the Holy Spirit is the one given to us as the gift from God to bring that life to reality. Not just a wish we could live that way, but actual growing steps of maturity and faithfulness as apprentices of Jesus, that we might truly be the salt and the light that God's called us to be. This is why the Sermon on the Mount is not just some impossible standard that we're meant to fall on our face because of. It is a life-giving, it is a purpose-shaping teaching. It is an essential part of our discipleship as followers of Jesus not to try in our own strength, but because God has given us his spirit to bring this reality to life in us. What a good father we have, amen? What a good father. He has given us his son. He has given us his spirit. He has adopted us as his children. He has made us citizens of his kingdom so that we might not only ask and receive for ourselves, 
but be blessed by him so that we might participate with him in blessing others. This is why as I wrap this up now, we gotta bring it back to where we started because I began with the Sermon on the Mount, or I'm sorry, we're in the Sermon on the Mount. I began with the golden rule. That's how Jesus follows up. He says, ask and you'll receive, seek and you'll find. You have a good father who wants to give you good gifts. So therefore, live like he does. Demonstrate the same radical, sacrificial generosity. We're asking and seeking and knocking, not just for our own comfort, but for what we need to be the people that God's called us to be. I came across this quote. I'm gonna share a few quotes with you just as we wrap up. This one came from John Piper. I think this was so good and was so convicting. He says this, he says, prayer is primarily a wartime walkie-talkie for the mission of the church as it advances against the powers of darkness and unbelief. It is not surprising then that prayer malfunctions when we try to make it a domestic intercom to call upstairs for more comfort in the den. Dang. Sometimes we have to be careful with like warfare metaphor. Think that somehow we are in this battle to destroy those around us. Remember the central part of this, one of the central parts of the Sermon on the Mount. Love your enemies. That's the warfare we're engaged in, in sacrificial love toward our enemies. Prayer is primarily a wartime walkie-talkie. We get it wrong if it's more... Hey, God, could I get another bag of chips? I'm kind of comfy down here. You know, my feet are a little cold. Could I get another throw pillow? That's not what we've been called to do. Let me give you one more I came across. Um, oh, man. What about those times when we don't know what to pray? We want to ask. We want to seek. We want to knock. But we're not sure what to do. Not only has God given us his Holy Spirit, one of the things the Holy Spirit does, as Paul says there in Romans 8, he prays for us. Especially when we don't know what to pray. He intercedes for us. And when we don't know what God's will is in a particular situation, Lord, do you want me to stay in this situation? Should I ask you for a way out? I don't know. Here's what I'm going to ask for. You know what's so cool about the Spirit? He always intercedes for us according to the will of God. He always prays appropriately. I love in, in um, Tim Keller's book on prayer. He commented on this verse. And these, these words, I remember reading that book when I was on my uh, first kind of ministry sabbatical about seven years ago. And this part has so shaped my prayer life ever since. He says this, he says, the spirit, even when you do not know how to pray, takes your core prayer as you should be praying before the throne. When you struggle in prayer, you can come before God with the confidence that he is going to give you what you would have asked for if you knew everything he knows. Oh, I have just come back to that so many times. Like literally pray that. I said, Lord, in this situation, this thing I'm going through right now, as far as I can see, which isn't very far, this is what I think I should ask for. At the same time, I acknowledge you see way more than I do. You understand way more than I do. So would you, would you give me what I would know to ask for if I knew everything you do? There is such comfort in our asking, our seeking and knocking. The way that Charles Spurgeon, this is the last thing I'll close. I'm gonna invite the band to come back up. He talked about even those times, it's so much better that this isn't a blank check promise where God will give us whatever we ask for because sometimes we ask for stupid stuff, right? He says, our heavenly father will correct our prayer and give us not what we ignorantly seek, but what we really need. Our prayers go to heaven in a revised version. I love that, I love that. <laughs> It would be a terrible thing if God always gave us all we ask for. Our heavenly father himself knows how to give far better than we know how to ask. Amen. So let us come to him regularly, repeatedly. He has what we need, not to spend it on our own pleasures. James 4 is really clear about that. If you ask and don't receive because you're just wanting it for yourself, that's missing it. But this golden rule that Jesus has called us to, this radical standard of generosity, God is far, infinitely more generous with us. So let's go to him for what we need, amen? Let me pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word. You have given us these words, Jesus, to invite us into this relationship with our Father, to command us, to train us 
to depend on and delight in a good father who loves to give the best gifts to his children. Would you make us better askers? Would you tune our hearts? Would you give us hearts to care about what you care about, to love what you love? And even when we ask wrongly, Lord, would you give us what you know we truly need because you are far better at giving than we are at asking. We love you. We thank you so much for your love for us. We pray this in the name of your son. Amen.